Good evening. This will be a tutorial for One World, going over all the features and functions of this amazing tool and essentially setting it up as a hub for you to quickly move around your make believe world, whatever that may be, and click a couple buttons and spawn maps quickly and efficiently for your players. And this will be a tutorial going over basics to advanced things, everything that I have ran into over the last 2000 plus hours using One World and other tools in Tabletop Simulator. So stick around and we'll get into it. Here we go. Firstly, you want to make sure that you're on a table that supports the size that One World shoots for. One World is sized for the custom rectangle table in Tabletop Simulator. And that custom rectangle table has a size or a aspect ratio of 1600 by 945. That's not the actual dimensions of it, but that's the aspect ratio. So there are tables that are sized for One World on the workshop. This particular one is Kraken sized for One World, and that is available on the workshop as well. To grab One World, you're going to want to go to the workshop and subscribe to the One World workshop. It is two words in the original author's creation, but everyone has, or most everyone has combined it into a single word. But you're going to want to click search on this, and you're going to look for the hub, which is this icon right here. So just grab the hub, and that is literally all you need from this workshop, is just the hub. So make sure you put that on your table somewhere away from the table itself. You don't want it near or in the zone that is going to be operated on by it. Anywhere else is usually fine. Just make sure that there's some areas around it for the buttons and things to work. So when we initialize this, we're going to see one bag pop up. The I button is the initialize when you're first starting up One World. You're going to press it once and there's a bag that spawns. If you press it again, a second bag spawns. These two bags will contain all of the information for your world, and we need to name them accordingly. Since this is a D&D &D example, I am going to name them D&D. &D. We'll call them both the same thing. So now that we have these two, we'll press the I again, and now we get our hub tokens. There's going to spawn two tokens, just like there were two bags. The one is W base, which you don't need to know the specifics of this, but I'm just explaining it for completeness's sake. W is for the minimap. It is on the actual controller here. And V, V base, is the full map that your players will see. So now that we have all of our components and these two bags are named accordingly, we hit lock and it covers the table with the V base component. So now we're initialized. Now we need to add a first map to One World. This will be the map that is the largest place, or most likely the largest place that your players will be in. So a world map, something that you can link your other maps from. So in this case, we're going to click the menu open on the left hand side here and click new to spawn a new map token that we're going to add our map with. You see how it's prefixed with SBX underscore. That is important to keep. Do not remove that. When you name your maps, and this one being the first one, where I'm just going to call it the name of the world map, which it is. So when you name your maps, do not put spaces in them and do not make them too terribly long. So if you're trying to put a whole bunch of information in there, it might bug out the build button, which we'll talk about later. But generally keep your map names short-ish and don't put spaces in them. So I call this one Corvair South, since it is going to be the south coast of the Corvair continent. We're going to right click this and hit custom. And this image field is where our map is going to go. This browse local files is what we're going to do to grab the map. But I need to say something first. The default file browser in Tabletop Simulator sucks. It really sucks, but they recently gave an option to use native file browsing. So I'm going to show you how to turn that on. In the menu, under configuration, then interface, miscellaneous settings, and scrolling most of the way down to the bottom, 
you'll see File Browser Native. Make sure that is turned on. There's a couple other settings in here that I would like to go over as well. They're not related to One World, but they're just, uh, I think, really nice to have. It's changing Hidden Zone Show Opacity to 0 0.1, changing Hidden Zone Hide Opacity to 0 0.3. And there's one more, and that's the option to display object drop position. By default, this is on for snapping. I like it turned off. This is completely personal preference and not related to One World, but just I'd like to explain that it is there if you'd like to play around with it. So now with native file browsing enabled, we're going to hit custom and then click browse local files here. You won't be able to see this because this is on my side, but I'm going to select a map, the Corvair South map from my machine. So now I need to click cloud here because I want to upload this file to the Steam Cloud so other people can actually see it. I hit cloud, I'm going to call it Corvair South 1. We're going to upload that and wait until this spinny loading symbol is gone before clicking import. It's gone and it's been replaced by the Steam Cloud URL. So hit import and that is going to load up our little map of Corvair South here. We're going to drop this on the One World zone. Rotating this does not change anything. Just drop it on there and it will load it in. So now it put it on the mini map and on the full table. One thing I always like to do is because this text is so see, see the length there, that is right about the length where you want to be the max for your map names, just so it nice fits nicely in there and doesn't bug anything out. But because that text is facing that way, I usually like to have north facing that way. So you can use these little triple dot buttons to flip the map around. So now this is facing north and I can see these texts along with the main text. So that's just a convenience thing. Notice when I created this, it spawned a link. This link references back to this map from anywhere. And it's what we use to transition between maps. Let's go over map editing. Let's say you want to change the name or the image on a map that you have imported. You can click the little edit button here and a little token will spawn on the side, the original token that you added for that map. And you can edit the name and the image on it. Then hit exit and it will pack it and you're right back to where you were. Now let's add another map, a, play, a destination where our players are going to go. So let's hit clear. And now we can see the new button again. Let's move our little link out of the way. And it fell through the table. Lovely hitboxes. So hit new. And it'll spawn another map. And this is going to be a, a desert courtyard map that I already sized for One World. We'll get to sizing later. So once again, we're going to hit cloud. And we're going to call it courtyard one. Wait for that to upload. And then hit import. All right, there we go. So now this is a courtyard map, and we'll just call it courtyard. All right. So keeping that SBX underscore in there, we're going to drop that on the map, and it's imported. So I kind of I, I'm okay with that being on the right hand side, but I want to flip it that way. There, I think that looks a little bit better. Once again, just showing that it's personal preference, or if you have text, that is how to get it to show the right way. So we want a link back to the main world map from this player map. So we can drop this little link, this link to the main world map onto our little mini map here. Drop that there and it turns into a button. That button can be clicked to go back to the main map. And let's say that this courtyard is somewhere in the mountains here. So let's put it down here. And now when we are on Corvair South, we can click on this button to transition to that courtyard map. This brings up an interesting question or an interesting topic, and that's with grid projection. By default, One World does not have the grid projected onto its maps. So let's say that this map, for example, it, it has a grid, but let's say it you, does not have a grid and you wanted to add a grid. If you turn on grid projection, see how there are no tabletop 
simulator grid lines displaying on the grid, that is because that is off by default in one world. But if we clear this and turn that on, it shows up. The way to handle that, the way to fix it, is to end the one world instance so that the bags and tokens appear on top and edit this vBase piece. So right click on it, go to toggles, and turn on grid projection. And now, when you turn on the grid, you notice there's a little grid display on there. And also, when you lock it now and go to your main map, you can see that the grid is there. It's, al it's always optional. You can toggle it on and off, but now you have the option of having grids turned on for your maps and get them, getting them scaled in nice um, gridless maps. So now we're going to get into packing of objects, being able to pack objects into your maps. So let's say the players are coming into this map and we want this dragon on the map waiting for them. So it's a nice big dragon and we want that to be automatically there. We, we don't want to have to create it. And let's add some walls in here as well. So this is a wall spawner from my D&D Tools workshop. So I'm going to make some yellow walls. Not that it would matter here, but let's just do that. And let's spawn some walls. This is just showing that objects can be added as well, as well as models. So now that that's on there, we just hit this menu option to pull it open again and hit pack. That will pack all of the objects that were on the table in that one world map. So now when we come back, it's empty until we hit this build button. When we hit build, the objects that were saved with that map come back. When you're leaving a map, you do not have to pack every time to make the objects go away. You can just hit clear or transition to a different map and it will automatically remove those. You don't need to pack it every time you leave, only when you want to change the locations or presence of objects on the map. So if I click here and go to Corvair South, it'll automatically remove the objects before it transitions. Let's say there's an item that you do not want to be packed by one world. Let's say it's in the zone, but you do not want it ever to be packed with the maps. You can do this very easily by dropping the object onto the one world hub. You'll see a do not pack message show up. That object will no longer be packed. It's referenced by GUID. It'll no longer be packed by one world. So if I go in here and move this mini onto the table and hit pack, the mini will be left behind after the map is gone. To remove that setting, you just drop the same item back on the hub and you'll get a will pack message. If you have noticed objects that are not packing with One World, this is likely the cause. Just drop that item on there and it will not pack. This is also how you can avoid tables and other table objects or like custom tables and things like that from being packed with One World. Shrink the table down. Unlock it so you can drop it onto One World so it's referenced by GUID. It, you'll get the will not pack message, then put your table back in the full size where it was and boot up One World. Um, you have to do this while One World is, is instantiated, but uh, it will no longer pack a table or other objects that are too close. After you have packed objects in a pack zone and during play you remove it from the map area and clear the map, it will not be deleted like the normal objects in the map are. It will, it will stick around, and if you rebuild the map again, you'll get a GUID duplicate message. They will, it will lift up slightly if it's not locked, and it'll say, yo, I'm not going to spawn a duplicate of this item because it's still on the table. If you clear it again and delete this item and do the build, the version that was packed will come back. Let's talk about utilizing Fog of War with One World. The easiest way that I've found to manage it is by utilizing a tool I made called the Fog of War Spawner. You click the button on top of it, and it drops a Fog of War zone on top of your One World map. All of the objects on it are hidden, 
and then it can be revealed as normal with a revealer. The Fog of War zone cannot be packed with one world. There is a way to do that with a workshop, but I would, but I would advise against it. It is called Fog of War Chips. You can link Fog of War zones to pieces that will be packed with one world. Uh, and I was originally including that with my D&D tools, but I have since stopped including that. The major reason being that when a partially revealed Fog of War comes back, there are massive frame rate issues for both clients and the host. And it is a generally very bad to pull back a partially revealed Fog of War. If you're pulling back completely unedited, Fogs of War that are clean, then it's relatively okay, but uh, partially revealed ones are an absolute no-go. And I haven't found a need to do that as long as I just have the spawner where I can click it once and it just spawns the zone exactly where it needs to be. The common practice that I use is I will blindfold my players. There's a blindfolded mod available on the workshop. Click that button once, build transition to, build your map, spawn the Fog of War with the one button, and then unblindfold your players and everything should work smoothly. And when you're done, just go up here and delete uh, your Fog of War once, once it's no longer needed. Let's say you're trying to get the grid on TTS to match an already gridded map that you have imported. That can be done manually with the grid system, but notice how this does not match up. And we can sort of get it matching with the sliders here, but it is nowhere near exact. And you can mess with the offsets a little bit to try to get it to match, but it's a very manual process and a bit finicky to do. So what you can do is I have an automated tool for this to make this go faster. You can disable the grid and then grab these measurement tools. You can put them in the center of grid squares and then say what that distance should be. So for us, this will be 10, 20, 30, 40 feet. So we'll right click this and turn on calibration and then say 40. And now that distance is 40 feet. And now if we turn on the grid and make it visible, it matches perfectly with this map. This is really useful for automatic resizing for distance measurement. So now, now that this is calibrated, we can put these off to the side and turn our grid off. And now the grid and tabletop is not visible, and it has this nice grid that was already in the map. It's not using the tabletop grid. But now we have, if we turn on grid snapping to center, now our miniatures automatically snap to the grid that came with this map. And also for measurements, for distance measurement, it's calibrated perfectly. So now when I drag this, it'll say, oh, that's 15 feet or 10 feet. And I don't have to have the grid up to have that uh, done. One thing, the grid settings for a map do not save automatically with one world. So let's build this so we can get our dragon back. And let's say we want to save this grid setting with this map. I also have a tool that covers that. It's a one world grid saver token. So you can take this, put it on your map, and right-click it and say Save Grid State. That will save the offset and the size of the grid for that map. So now, once we wait for the 10-second save tick, I'll be fixing that shortly. But right now, we have to wait for the 10-second save tick with TTS. And then pack that grid saver token that we've added, we can lock that to the table. We pack that grid saver token with the map. And let's go back to, uh, let's go back to this. And now let's mess with the grid, make it bad. So we'll change it so that it's super tiny. And this does not match at all. But then we hit build. And our grid settings come back along with our models and everything matches up perfectly. You can also save, uh, by default, One World does not allow you to save or doesn't have the functionality to save line drawings with its maps. So we can, 
one, so once again, use a tool that I created called the line saver tokens, which allow you to save drawings on the map. So this, this is talking about the, the drawing tool. You, by default, this will not save with the map. So what you can do is, with the line saver token, I'll lock it again, just like the other one. You can enable drawing mode. And now drawing mode is enabled, it says down here. And now we can draw on this map. And we'll make it in a nice contrasting color, like green. So now let's, uh, let's just make a snake through these uh, holes. So now we can hit save lines. It'll say waiting for save tick. And once the save tick happens, we can pack this map and say, uh, we'll just say, yep, already just disabled drawing mode. So now we can save this map by packing it. And notice how it doesn't have the lines on it. But as soon as we build, our lines and our models come back. So this is, this is really useful for if you want to create a map on the fly. Let's say you load up just a white carpet or a, a default grid map and you want to draw a map, you can draw a map on the fly by using this lightsaber tool. So yeah, just a couple of useful things that are available with TTS. I'll showcase quick the changing of size with my models because this mini injector will automatically change model size based on the grid to match them. So if we go to Corvair South and we'll go to the guitar zone, if we build that, you'll notice it got slightly smaller. And we just say turn on the grid. So now it matches up with this map. And if I go to the Vegas map, which is a much larger map, and click build on it, I'll actually pull this in closer so you can see. If I build it with this calibrated grid, because I have this grid calibrated, the mini gets really tiny <laughs> to match. So now this mini will match the sizing for this map. So it's, a, it's just a nice way to be able to quickly transition and set up your maps and grids ahead of time so you don't have to go messing with the grid when you want to spawn it for your players. Let's talk about dimension limits on packing. So this map is a good example of that. This map goes up to pretty much the height limit of the packing a box that One World uses. So this map has a bunch of bookcases that are floating in the air. This is about the height limit that One World will check for objects to save into its maps. It goes all the way down to the floor and all the way to the edges, but this is about the height limit that it will check for objects, which I haven't really found a need to go higher than that, thankfully. So, yeah. Let's go over map importing from other workshops or other people where you've gotten pre-built maps from. There are a lot of workshops on the Steam Workshop for Tabletop Simulator with pre-built maps that you can pull in if you don't want to add a whole bunch of 3D objects yourself. To do that, you can clear yourself down to the base and then grab a map. You'll see a OWX underscore for a map that is a one-world pre-built map whether that's by a person or by the original creator, Tattletail. So drop that on. It'll import the art. And we have our little token, our little link. Let's grab another one. And a third one. I seem to have put this perfectly where there is a lack of hitbox on this shelf. Now we have imported three maps. Let's get them on our main world. Hitting next or last will go to the next or last map that you have looked at in this current session. If you want to see all of them, they won't all be there until you click clear and then hit see all. And that'll let you switch between all of the maps that are currently in your instance, not just the ones that you have viewed this time loading your save. So let's go back to here and let's place our guitar zone on a path. Let's put Walking Box Cavern in the mountains 
and we'll put the Vegas Strip down on Sharn, because why not? So those maps are now on our world, and we can transition to them and load them up. But we need links from this map to come back to. So let's spawn a few of these links from this map so we can get back to it. So we'll go to Vegas Strip. And let's say we want to leave here to get back to Corvair South. And let's load up our guitar zone. And let's say we want to leave through the little exit thing to get back. And for our walking box cavern, let's say the entrance leads back to Corvair South. When you load up a pre-made map, it will have its art automatically imported. And when you build it, it will pull in all of the assets that the original map artist added. So here we have one that I made, which is just a cavern from the New Vegas game. And one caveat to remember is that when you import people's maps, there are very likely to be, at least in some cases, missing assets. And you'll get a whole bunch of missing asset bundles and missing models. That is normal as copyright strikes happen, sites go offline, Objects get expired on websites. It just happens over time. But if you load in that map and it still looks fine to you, then it might be perfectly all right for your uses. As soon as you clear off all of the missing asset dialogues, just repack the map by opening this up, hit pack, and your map will not have those missing assets anymore once you close out all of the dialogues. Let's talk about exporting. Say you have this map, this ridiculously simple map that just has a dragon and a few things on it. If you want to export that for whatever reason and send it to another table or post it to the workshop, you can just hit the export button after building it and it will put that map into a bag and you can take that bag and put it wherever. You can also move your One World instance to another table completely wholesale. To do that, you need to clear down to where the bags and tokens are on top of it. Then you can either select it all, right click and save object as whatever you want to call it, and then pull that back via the saved object feature. Alternatively, you can create a bag and drop that entire thing into it. Everything will be inside. You can save that bag and then import that bag into your new table. When you import it and you pull out the pieces, be careful not to pull anything out of these two bags. These two bags are very important. Their order inside matters. There a lot of things matter. A lot of things matter about them. They have specific IDs as well. It gets really finicky and glitchy if you edit or change anything inside these. So grab your hub out of it. These do not be, need to be on top of it. Just get it to a portion of your table where you want it to go on your new table. Hit initialize, then lock. Those pieces will disappear and you're right back to where you were before. So hit last and your main map, the first map that shows up when you initialize One World will always be that first map you initially added. Let's talk about some caveats and things that you should look out for when using One World. One, that aspect ratio of 1600 to 945 is not a flippant suggestion. That is something that is actually very important. When you're creating maps or adding maps that do not follow that, you're going to run into issues. It, either with packing of maps, not including stuff around the edges, or adding links. It is rather important that you stick to that aspect ratio. Not for it just looking good, some of the functionality breaks as well. But thankfully, it's easy to get things to that aspect ratio. Here's GIMP. This is GIMP, which is a free image editor that I use for preparing my maps to go into One World and Tabletop Sim. In this case, the map that I'm going to import is portrait mode, and it is at the wrong aspect ratio. So to fix that, we go to image, transform, rotate 90 degrees counterclockwise. And now it's landscape. 
And to make it the right aspect ratio, we can use the crop tool here and set fixed aspect ratio 1600 by 945. And when we draw it, when we drag that, it's going to make a crop zone that is that exact aspect ratio. So we just click, and now our map is the exact size and rotation that we need for one world. The counter side to that are maps that you need to expand rather than crop because you don't want any of them lost. This is a square map, so to make it work for one world, we need to add bits to the edges. So you can do that by doing image and then canvas size. Make sure this is unlinked here, so the link is not selected, and then expand it out to larger than you think is necessary to make it work. So we're going to expand this out to probably double the size. Then hit center to slap the image into the center of it. Set our foreground color to black, resize to all layers, and hit resize. And it's going to add black borders to the sides. Now, with that same aspect ratio, we can crop down and get the exact center, and bam. That map is now importable into One World, and we don't lose any of it. When exporting for One World, sometimes it has problems with transparency channels or alpha channels on maps, and it'll cause big gashes to run through the center of them. When that happens, if you notice it, sometimes it, it, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But if that does happen, either save your image as a JPEG or remove the alpha channel. Another thing is that when you're modifying your maps to fit one world, never use scale image to get the right aspect ratio because that will cause squashing. And when you squash it or stretch it to match the aspect ratio, you're going to mess up at the squares or gr the grid of whatever map you're using. If you're using gridless maps, that's fine. But if you're using gridded maps, ones that already have the grids on them, then do not ever use image scale because that will make the squares non-square, which means you'll never be able to get it to match properly with the TTS grid and still make them square. If you make the TTS grids rectangles, then that kind of ruins the, the measurements and stuff in scripts that a lot of things use. So yeah, be careful when using scale image and never use it on gridded maps. I will quick show you what happens when you try to import a map that is very wrong in terms of aspect ratio. So about as wrong as you can get is a portrait map that is very tall. So I'm going to add a new map here. And we're going to call this map. Uh, okay, we'll import this cloud. And so this is a portrait map that is very tall. We're going to call it tall boy. And although this is a very nice map in terms of its actual art, it does not work well with One World. When you drop it on here, it's going to do that. And it's going to look ridiculous on your table. You can get around this-ish with non-gridded maps by pressing the Fit Frame button, because these, these flip buttons do not actually rotate anything. They only flip it in that direction. So if I press fit frame, it will fit it to the frame. Once I hit last because it had to pack, it will fit it to the frame. But because this is a gridded map, I now have rectangles instead of squares for the grid. So this is going to wreck any kind of distance measurement. The minis that I use for the D&D tools will actually measure using the TTS grid. So it'll automatically know how much distance you've traveled and can tell that to the players. And It'll also mess with things like grid snapping because now they're not squares anymore. So doing this with non-gridded maps is okay-ish. You'll still have a stretched map, but with gridded maps, it is just an absolute no-go. Also, if you reset this, and let's say you want to try to use this in this current state, and you want to put a link onto it. Let's say we want to link Corvair South to this map. We'll put Tallboy up here somewhere. I cannot put a link out here. It'll snap it to, to the inside, the, the maximum distance where this bounding box is. So it'll still try, but it just will not, it'll not put it where I want it to go. 
The way One World stores its maps on the table is actually up in the corner of the table, and this is visible to your players, which is something that you need to know about. They are up floating above the table in the corner here. They are usually out of sight, out of mind, but it is good to know that they are there. And when you alternate between maps, you will be able to see some of the other maps that you have loaded in that session up here, or at least your players might be able to if they go and look up here. So that is something to know about, and that needs to be hidden from them. So I have a tool for this, and it is able to hide that from your players. It is uh, my One World Fog of War spawner. It has an option on the right click menu for it to hide the One World minimaps. If you use that right click option and hide One World minimaps, you'll see a little zone pop around it. And if I change the color to blue here, you'll see that that zone is opaque and it can't be seen through to see those maps where they would originally. Another thing to note, the One World hub will not normally be hidden by a GM hidden zone. So if I am GM and I spawn a hidden zone around One World, and actually let's expand that so that it includes the, the mini on the right hand side there. If I swap to blue, I can't see that mini, but I can still see One World. The solution to this, once again, it's an automated tool, is to put the is to put a opaque hidden zone around one world. So I'm going to remove this hidden zone and use the other option on here, which is to hide the one world hub. And that will spawn an opaque hidden zone around one world hub, the one world hub, wherever it happens to be on your table. Also, you don't really see it with those hidden zone settings that I described earlier. You don't really see the hidden zone. It's slightly there, but it's not that uh, annoying as the GM. And now your players can't see it. One world cannot be rotated or tilted. Whenever you initialize it, it will always turn to a specific rotation and a specific tilt. It'll always be flat and it will always face toward the table the way that it is currently facing in my examples. The maximum number of links that you can have on a particular map to other maps from that map is 84. I do not know why someone would hit that limit, but that is definitely something to consider if you are being a ridiculous person and adding a whole ton of maps to a single hub. So you will need several separate hubs if you want to add more than 84 links. Another thing to note is that joints do not save with One World Maps. Attachments do, but joints do not. So let's say if we join these two objects together, they move together, but they are still separate objects. As soon as you put the minis or objects in a bag and pull them back out again, that joint is broken. So this is a limitation on TTS's side, not One World's side. So just keep in mind about that. You can attach things together and save them with your One World maps, but fixed joints will not work because One World uses bags to save things and TTS does not save joints with bags. When you load up a complicated map, let's say the Vegas strip map that I have, which is about the most complicated one that I had. I went into the New Vegas game and exported these models directly, at least the buildings. So one thing to note, when you have non-convex colliders or complicated colliders, if you end up using that, which this one is, the Ultralux Hotel. And I usually have the problems with this. Let's see if it happens. Okay, there it is. So this building has a real collider that covers everything on it, but this thing is just sitting on it and it should not be. And it slides down the front if I put it like that. That should not be happening. And when you put your models on it, they will also sit in the air or roll around which also should not be happening. If you notice that problem, just hit the sync button. There's a sync button on One World. Just hit that, you'll see the models flicker and their colliders will be reloaded. So now you should be able to put this on and it'll sit exactly where it should without any issues. That is particularly an issue for non-convex colliders, but I have seen it on other things too. If you notice that the build button 
on one world is gone for some reason, but it should be there because this map has buildable objects in it. It is likely because you have made your map name too long and with spaces. You can see how the build button is here. I can clear and go back and the build button is there. But if I edit this map to be something really long, and hit exit edit mode, and go back to the map, the build button is gone now. Just make sure to keep your maps sh names relatively short and without spaces, and the build button will show up again. There is a way around this, and that is, uh, and still keep your long names, although it's finicky, is to hit next to another map, and then last, and it will fix itself. And the, the build button will come back. But that has to be done every time if you want to manage really long names for maps. If you have a problem where a build of a map does not complete, it stalls, either with the cloud that is still up here above the map during the build or after the objects have been dropped down onto the map, it is very likely a object that has a non-convex collider, or, uh, specifically a model uh, or an asset bundle. One of the ways to get around it, at least for me, was to, or for me, it was this building specifically. You can go into it, hit custom, and hit import again. And that will likely finish the build. It took me a little bit to figure out which object it was, and um, it was not always an issue. But that is a way to get it to complete the build, because after you hit that import button again, it will say build completed once you find the right object, um, which can take some time depending on how complex your situation is. But just letting you know that is a way to get around a issue where the build does not seem to be completing properly. Another thing to note is that, as with any object that gets spawned by a script in Tabletop Simulator, it is not guaranteed to have the same ID that it was saved with. It might have a different one. So if you build a map and an object was saved with it with a particular GUID and it comes back with a different one, if you have a script outside of your map that relies on something in the map having a specific GUID, then that will break. Granted, I have not ran into this problem before, but I have seen reports of it happening for other people. So it may not happen for your case, but just letting you know that if you do run into problems with scripts that rely on GUIDs, that might be the cause. And I'd be remiss if I did not mention D&D tools. D&D Tools is a collection of tools I put together to make playing D&D and Tabletop Simulator much more efficient and streamlined. It includes initiative tracking, health tracking, automatic mini resizing when the grid changes, measured movement, stabilization, 5e status effects, and a bunch of other niceties. You can modify your grid and calibrate it to maps that you import. You can save those grid calibrations with your One World maps. You can automatically resize AOE markers when you have effects going off, spawn walls, spawn floors, spawn fog of wars that automatically scale and shape to the One World zone, roll at advantage and disadvantage and save with save slots. It's just a bunch of different cool things. If D&D is not your thing, that's all good. But if it is, check it out and see if it does good things for you. If not, I hope this tutorial on One World has been informative, and I hope you have a wonderful night. Take care.